Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your concerns, your inquiries, your observations, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. About 24 hours ago, I posted in the YouTube community tab. Many of you left comments, and I will go about 30 minutes here um, responding to those comments on this Friday night. Um, I've said that I'm going to move mailbags to Wednesday. Expect that uh, soon. So uh, this might be the last Friday mailbag. Hmm? All right, let's get right to it. Here is Jordan. How do you think Alcaraz would have done in the ATP finals if he was 100% physically and able to play? It seems like indoor hard courts are not his specialty, but would have loved to see him play against the other top guys. Yeah, I'm not sure about the indoor hardcourt statement at the end of that comment. But I will say any surface that rewards great serving so heavily is going to put Carlos Alcaraz at a disadvantage. He is simply not going to be able to take advantage of these conditions as some of the other players in the field would be able to. He undoubtedly, alongside Rafael Nadal, would have the worst serve, the worst first serve in this field. It's a really strong serving ATP Finals field. I'd be curious to look through the recent editions of this event and see where this stacks up. But I'm thinking that this is one of the better serving fields you have. I mean, you're looking at Stefano Tsitsipas as the two seed. Nadal the one, and obviously I'm putting him in a lower tier, but really everybody else far above average from uh, Tsitsipas to Kasparud to Daniil Medvedev to Felix to Rublev to uh, Djokovic and Fritz. It, it, everyone is putting up great stats, great numbers on their first serve. Everyone. I mean, the numbers honestly have been astronomical. And uh, you look at the the number of close sets that have been played as well, the number of tie breaks. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked that we didn't get a tie break in Rublev Tsitsipas. That was the first three setter that we've seen that didn't have a tie break. Uh, so it would have been fascinating to see Al how Alcaraz fared considering that the conditions actually would not have suited him. And uh, we would have learned a lot about what the potential is is for Alcaraz's serve right now uh, because surely he would have had the mentality that, okay, I need to serve better because in these conditions, I will be rewarded for that. Um, the Alcaraz serve in general, I really think it's going to get a lot better very, very fast. It looks natural. He's got a live arm. The technique is good. I see no reason why it's not going to get better very fast. Uh, I've just seen a wide range of outcomes with it. I, I also think that Carlos should get some credit for serving great in the biggest match of his life thus far. The U.S. Open Final against Kasparud. Ruud. I would not be too hard on his serve right now, which is undoubtedly a shot that needs to improve, undoubtedly the weakest part of his game, but it's really not all that bleak. I think it's going to be a lot better very quickly. Anyway, uh, I don't think Alcaraz would have had a chance, but I, I do hate to say that uh, because it's it's the kind of prediction that I really don't like making. We'll never know if I'm right or wrong, uh, which makes it feel a little bit useless for uh, for me to even kind of go there. But the conditions would not have suited him. KH, simple question. What's next for Daniil Medvedev? Will he be able to return to his peak level? Peak level. So here's where I'm at with Medvedev 2023. I think there's a lot of reasons to think that it won't get worse than it was last year. It felt like of all the things that could have happened this year, it, it's a lot of stuff that went wrong, okay? He lost an absolute heartbreaker in Australia. He injured himself 
during the Sunshine Double and had to have hernia surgery. He was banned from Wimbledon. There are distractions with what's happening in his country. Those are the th all things that might lead you to believe that next year is likely to be a little bit better. I do have my doubts about him getting back to world number one. Uh, not that I don't think it can happen. It's just at this moment, I'm kind of doubting it. I just think that he has limitations. He has weaknesses. We also know the things that he's great at. Uh, and I've I've made my stance kind of known about the fact that I do think Medvedev at this point, very close to a finished product. I don't expect that many things to get a lot better from here. And that finished product, maybe he does win more slams. He continues to be a top five player, but I do question whether or not we are going to look at Daniil Medvedev and see a guy who's the best in the world ever again. Um, I, I question that. If you're asking me, is he going to have a better year? Is he going to remain a top five player? To those questions, I would say yes. The next question I believe is also about Medvedev, so let's move on to that. Uh, NK Speaks asks, what is wrong with Medvedev? I mean, seriously, he has gone from one of the best to being completely exploited by serve and volley with an unwillingness to change tactics. Why is he so bad recently? In this form, I do not see him defending his finals position at Australian Open 2023. So he's bad relative to what we know he can do. Let's just make sure to maintain some perspective here uh, because Daniil Medvedev in his last three events has made a semifinal and got injured against Djokovic. Uh, won a title in Vienna where he beat Team Sinner, Dimitrov, and Shapovalov. Uh, then he had a tough loss, first round, Alex Dimonor, and uh, just went 0 3 at this ATP Finals in a very interesting way. Obviously, I, I haven't seen this stat. I imagine nobody has ever gone 0 and 3 at this year end at the year end championships by losing three deciding set tie breaks. So there's a negative spin to that. He was shaky under pressure. He did not execute under pressure. He was not good in these third set tie breaks. The positive spin on that which I don't think is invalid, is he was in every match. He technically could have been 3-0. and He, at the very least, should have been 2-1. and He put himself in a position to serve for two out of those three matches. So that's the first thing I have to say to the comment, is, you know, we are used to Daniil Medvedev. These last three seasons, we're used to him winning titles consistently this time of year. North American hardcourt summer, indoor hardcourt fall. We're used to him winning titles. And, you know, he won one. It was a 500. We're used to seeing him do better than that. There's no doubt about it. We're used to seeing him maybe win Toronto, maybe win Cincy, maybe win the U.S. Open, maybe win Paris-Bercy, maybe, maybe win the Tour Finals. We didn't get that. Um, so I got that. All right. What is wrong with him? That's the, the real crux of the question. Um... Shifting the conversation away from all of the things that have happened this year and just looking at what he is as a tennis player right now, why are players able to beat him? I mean, you did kind of attack it here. Nobody is surprised by Medvedev anymore. And I think for a couple years, players were. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know, uh, they expected to beat him a certain way that was impossible and, and it wasn't realistic. Uh, you see a guy like Stefano Tsitsipas swallowing his pride and playing a different way. Using tactics against him that are not Stefano Tsitsipas tactics. No, they are, I'm playing Daniil Medvedev tactics. And it takes a while for top players to do that. It generally requires them to lose some matches 
most most players just want to play their own game unless they are forced to change. So I think we saw that with the Stefano Tsitsipas, who happens to have the tools to execute a good game plan against him. Uh, I think, you know, he ran into Nick Kyrgios. Nick Kyrgios ruined his North American hardcore season. Kyrgios just happens to be a player who had a great year and can do that same thing. A lot of the things that Tsitsipas does, uh, Kyrgios can do. He's really good at net. Um, he is a really good server and can exploit this return strategy for Medvedev that is that he's been very rigid with. And Djokovic can exploit it too. And Djokovic has. Um, a bunch of players can. Um, so tactically, strategically, that's been an issue for Medvedev. Is uh, that, you know, he's supposed to be an elite returner. Elite. And that just hasn't been the case. Now, let me pull up the numbers here so that I can substantiate that because I know it won't be difficult for me to do so. Uh, if we look at uh, break percentage, he's way down. Uh, break percentage in 2019, 27.9%. 2020, 27.5. 2021, best year ever in break percentage and best win percentage. He broke 31.4%. 2022, he is at 25.9%. At that is his worst break percentage in uh, since 2018 when he wasn't a top 20 player. I do need to put one disclaimer in there. He did not play clay court season. Although he's not good on clay, that may have helped his break percentage because it's easier to break on clay. Maybe. Just going to throw that out there. So he's no, he's just not returning at the level that he used to, um, or or that he's used to returning at, and that there needs to be, uh, he needs to go into the lab and figure out how to make those adjustments and be able to take the return earlier at times. Um, but I also think there's some execution stuff with nerves and confidence. Um, I think the the regular uh, version of Daniil Medvedev at his best can kind of. His offense on off the ground, it's it's Andy Murray style. Does he have a lot of finishing power? No, he does not. Does that mean he can't force errors? Does that mean he can't plot, apply pressure with his offense off the ground? No, it doesn't. It shouldn't. Because generally, he's able to move the ball around the court and play very precise, change direction a lot, use his depth, and the pace, it's not huge. The heaviness, it's not huge. But it's just enough to, at the very least, keep players on the run and keep players under pressure. And if you're not going to hit winners, fine. You're still able to force errors. You're still still able to win points on your terms. I just think Medvedev's ground game right now, the confidence isn't there when he needs to take charge and be aggressive. It's just not there. So that's what that's that's what I think is wrong with Daniil Medvedev right now. All right, some fun ones here. This one's from Medezio. Uh, what's your favorite tennis documentary? How good is the current state of content creation around tennis from YouTube to documentaries in your opinion? Um, my favorite tennis documentary, the first thing that comes to mind, I guess, is the Marty Fish doc, which is part of the Untold series. I also highly recommend on Netflix, um, which I believe both of these are from the same creators. Oh, actually, one of them might be different. Anyway, the Manti Teo doc, uh, it's about, even if you don't like football, you can enjoy this story. It's one of the craziest and greatest sports stories, greatest in terms of just intrigue, uh, I think of all time, where this uh, linebacker who played for Notre Dame football, uh, Manti Teo, um, basically was a victim of of a catfishing on a national level, like everybody. Anyway, that's all I'll say about it. It's amazing. Uh, amazing sports story in general. Uh, yeah, the Marty Fish doc was amazing. I actually have a video about it. I did a, a little reaction after watching it. Uh, and then, obviously, you have, um, I might be forgetting what it's called, John Wertheim's documentary about Federer versus Nadal Wimbledon 2008 final. Um, that one is excellent. 
you have a good one on um, as part of the uh, from the 30 for 30 team at ESPN about the fight for equal prize money at the slams uh, centered around Venus Williams, especially and, and her effort to achieve that for women's tennis. That is a good one. Um, I believe there's one on HBO that I haven't gotten to yet about, uh, about John McEnroe. I believe, I believe if I'm not misforgetting. Anyway, uh, the second part of the question is how good is the current state of content creation around tennis, YouTube documentaries, in your opinion? Not great. Now uh, you have this behemoth looming in, in the Netflix thing, which I'm excited about. Originally, I thought it was going to be ready for the start of 2023. I think it's a little bit suspicious that we haven't heard anything about that. Uh, it makes it makes me feel a little bit suspicious that they might be running behind schedule and we, we might get that later than we planned. That doesn't come from any kind of inside information. Uh, that That is huge. That is looming. And that might change everything uh, for, you know, tennis as, as it did in Formula One. Uh, the biggest factor for that is going to be, is it good? Okay. Is it good? <laughs> That's going to determine, uh, do people enjoy it? Uh, cause if people don't enjoy it, it's not going to have that effect. So let's see what happens with that. Uh, but overall, I think there are some, some really good, uh, some good stuff on, on YouTube. I think, um, cult tennis is excellent. I think that base, this is a shameless plug. I'm complete. This is a complete, you know, uh, con full uh, full disclosure. I do work for them, but uh, Baseline Tennis, Baseline Media, uh, is a is a new channel that has just started up that I've done some some content for, and uh, they do an excellent job. Kind of, you know, with with various topics. I don't want to I don't want to summarize it, but uh, you can check that one out. Um, and again, it's kind of these four to six minute pieces that they do very in depth. Those are good. Uh, visually, very visually appealing pieces, heavily researched generally, uh, heavily produced. And, you know, it could definitely be better. Uh, my biggest complaint with tennis content creation is uh, sometimes I want to learn about players and there's, you know, there's nothing out there. And I think the written side and the podcasting side, I think those two areas have really suffered from a lack of access to the players. That has been my opinion for a long time. I think that if you take a random player, uh, let's take... Look, uh, essentially, essentially, I think there needs to be more feature and long-form content and I, I would like there to be more storytelling around around the players um, outside of what we hear from them at press conferences. That I would like very much. All right. Uh, this is from Nidaklan, which is a comment that got five likes, which was one of the higher liked comments. It's, does Nadal have any elite slash tier one weapons left besides mental toughness? Is even that eroding as he slows down and the game starts to feel like it is coming at him faster? Or am I just overreacting to how toothless and tepid his game looks at times on quick indoor hard courts? Yeah, yeah, you're completely overreacting. Like very, very much so. Uh, you're overreacting after... A player won the first two majors of 2022 and got an injury at Wimbledon and came back and never found it. Uh, apparently had a lot of issues, you know, figuring out or, or recovering from the injury as he came back and look, he gave the U.S. Open a go. There were things happening off the court as well. Uh, some... Some, some complications in his personal life. He said his mind wasn't there. All right, he wasn't good at Cincinnati. He wasn't at the, good at the U.S. Open. He comes back. He loses to Tommy Paul uh, in the first round of the Paris Masters, having, you know, played very few matches and, you know, playing on this low-bouncing indoor hard court. He comes to the ATP Finals. Nobody's expecting him to do well. 
Uh, he plays two guys with enormous serves, uh, tons of offensive firepower in the quickest conditions you can possibly have on tour. And he loses those two matches and then he beats Kasparud. Ruud. Like, all of this can be explained. Uh, and I, I just... I have no alarm right now with Nadal. I have no alarm. Uh, I have optimism. I'll get to that because there's another question about it. Uh, you know, Nadal in 2023. So let me save that for, for that point. But uh, elite tier one weapons, the forehand, the uh, point construction, the drop shot, the net play in volleys. So, you know, the hands, you could synthesize that into just saying, you know, he's got great feel and touch, the lobs included, uh, what he does when he gets to drop shots, how well he plays those balls. You know, all of those things are on point. Uh, and the return of serve. The return of serve is, is still tier one. There's no doubt. House of Leaves. Hi, Gil. My question is about Alcaraz. We've seen the last two U.S. Open winners have poor follow-up seasons to their victory. Do you think Alcaraz will need to have a good result at the Australian Open to keep his momentum and prevent going into a dip like Team and Medvedev? By the way, on that documentary question, get involved in the comments. Let me know what I missed because I'm sure I have missed some. Um, basically, yeah, so Dominic Team struggled Mentally, the motivation was just a, a big problem after he won the U.S. Open. And I remember getting a very similar question in the mailbag around this time of year, last year, about Daniil Medvedev. And it was, Gil, how can Daniil Medvedev avoid the same thing that Dominic Team suffered? And I talked about two things. One, I talked about, you know, how Team literally worked 10 years for that and Medvedev it was a much shorter period of time so you're a little bit less likely to get that heavy hangover effect uh it's also about what your goals are as a player and some players dream a lot bigger uh than winning one major so when they get the first it's like all right uh, obviously that's a huge accomplishment, but some players feel satisfied and some players just don't feel satisfied plain and simple um, so everyone reacts completely differently. Everyone is different. I don't think the U S open, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the U S open and the title that Medvedev won at the U S open was a big factor in what happened this year, considering, um, he was pretty good after the U S open finals of the Paris masters finals at the, uh, ATP finals where he looked great. He went 3-0 and in the group stage. Lost his Zverev in the final. Um, and then at Davis Cup, I mean, the competition wasn't great, but he did end the year with five straight victories. Then he comes in, start of 2022. Picks up a bunch of good wins at the ATP Cup. He beats Alex Di Minori, beats Matteo Berrettini, Felix, all at the ATP Cup. Uh, and then is up two sets to love on Nadal at the Australian Open. So there's not a lot of evidence that suggests that the U.S. Open title has anything to do with what happened to Medvedev. But in the case of Alcaraz, I just think it's such a different calculus. Juan Carlos Ferrero, after the match, was like, Carlitos is 60% of the player that he can be. And I think Alcaraz feels that way. As he should. He's 19. He just got here. So he's he's dreaming big. He's dreaming huge. Uh, psychologically, it's a completely different ball game for a guy like Alcaraz. I think that answered the question. What will he need to have a good result? Yeah. Uh, I'm fascinated to see, you know, what he does this offseason, what he focuses on, what he works on, because he is a workhorse. And last offseason, all the focus was on physical. It was, you know, get strong enough, get strong enough, get strong enough. And he did it. He checked that box and he came into this season a beast physically. Um, now Ferrero has said, we are happy with where he is physically. All good. Thumbs up. That's not the focus. 
How are they going to spend this offseason? What are they going to do? I'm so excited to find out. From Jacob Schmidt, uh, have you ever thought about permanently bringing about another personality on board to your show to co-host such as Alex Gruskin or Matt Bradshaw? I feel like this could bring your show and channel to the next level. Not that your show isn't already great, but I feel having multiple personalities, multiple perspectives, and a bit of bantering could broaden your audience. Inside the NBA is a great example. I love Inside the NBA, man. That show is special. You can't teach what they have. That's the greatest studio show in all of sports television, no doubt. So shout out, shout out. All right, here's what, I, here's what I'll say to that. Have I considered this or do I consider this? I do, but it would not replace what I do. Uh, because if I had another personality on board, it would be a totally different show. It's not the same show. It's a different show. Uh, what I seek to accomplish, uh, in terms of my, my breakdowns, my long form breakdowns, I feel I'm the only person who does that. Uh, you know, and obviously I felt that, you know, people have appreciated what I do there. You can't do that with another person. Uh, you know, I'm making a, a long form argumentation that doesn't really like when I'm, when I'm digging in to the level and the depth that, that I'm attempting to, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't work with another person, you know, it, that, that kind of is a monologue, but, uh, you bring on another person and I've, I've enjoyed, you know, having guests on the show, there's no doubt about it. Uh, that has its own perks. You're absolutely right. Uh, the key is, is that if I were to do that, it would be in addition to, um, because I, it, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't serve the same purpose of what I generally do on Monday Match Analysis. Uh, it's funny, though. I have booked a guest for this next Monday Match Analysis. Uh, so I, I do like, I do really like starting the show, little monologue, little little breakdown, and then having that conversation with the guest. But, um, you know, the possibility that I see is potentially getting on a schedule of doing kind of a three-time-per-week thing. Uh, Monday match analysis on Monday, where it's that kind of in-depth breakdown, so, you know, monologue. Uh, mailbags on Wednesday, where I take your comments. And then maybe on Friday, maybe every Friday, I do something with someone else. Just uh, so, so that's where my head's at. Uh, the mailbag, if you guys like want to talk about this kind of stuff, that's why I say tennis or anything else, because I'm down to chat about this stuff and to, to let you guys in. Um, whatever I'm thinking. And by the way, in the off season, I'm going to do a mailbag where you guys aren't gonna, aren't allowed to ask me about tennis, but obviously we're going to wait till the off season because right now there's tennis to talk about. Uh, there's another question here, which is what do you consider being a bigger black mark on a player's resume? Not winning the world tour finals or the Olympics. Oh, sorry. I voiced that terribly. Not winning the world tour finals or the Olympics. My take is that it is definitely the world tour finals because it is without a doubt the most difficult tournament to win of the two. No easy draws. You face the best of the best. And you have to have a very good year just to qualify. You get many more opportunities to win as opposed to the Olympics, meaning the flaws of the player, uh, the flaws of the player are more manifested. Okay. Um, first of all, ooh, it's it's kind of tough because the Olympics. Look, I think in, in evaluating what a player can do, generally speaking, the World Tour Finals are more important because you get a chance to do it every year. So you get a larger sample size over the course of a career. Uh, you get to kind of understand where a player is at. Uh, obviously, yes, you, you know, look, Tokyo, let's be honest, Tokyo felt weird. The conditions, you know, the, the crazy humidity, best of three. Even though I, I know World Tour Finals is best of three as well, uh, you know you just you, you had a lot of wonkiness. It felt like uh, the 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 courts being so high bouncing, like weirdly high bouncing. I don't know. There was there was some weird stuff with the World Tour Final uh, with uh, the Tokyo Olympics where it it just it felt. I don't know. It's a great honor to do well at the Olympics. Is the thing. It's a huge honor. It, it carries weight 
outside of tennis, if you are an Olympian, you can go to anyone on the sidewalk. They might not care about tennis. If you are an Olympic gold medalist, that means something to everyone. And in that way, the Olympics are bigger and more important than the World Tour Finals. Uh, but if you are going to evaluate in a vacuum, what means more to like, let's say, a Hall of Fame resume, then yeah, the World Tour Finals mean a little bit more than the Olympics. And just to be very, very clear, uh, the World Tour Finals, uh, they don't mean... They don't mean much more than a Masters 1000, I, I think, when you when you look back on someone's career. Uh, they, they mean a little bit more, but it's it's not it's not hugely different. It it does feel, I think, a bit like uh like a specialty event. Um and you know I don't know. Look, full disclosure on this question, I don't feel too strongly about it. I don't feel I I, I don't. Um Neither of them are close to a major. Let's end on that. <laughs> uh, all right, Bruno Alves. I think this tournament was actually a positive for Nadal. Maybe his first tournament without injury concerns since Acapulco in February slash March. I didn't think he looked bad at all, just off rhythm. Do you see good perspectives for Rafa in Australia? Can we just talk about the health? Can we focus on that? The memory is so short for tennis fans sometimes. We didn't know how much longer Rafa Nadal was going to be able to play after Roland Garros. He left that event on crutches. That foot was a problem once again. Just, that it, it, just as it had been a huge problem throughout the second half of 2021, of which he missed most of. Things were looking bleak. Things were looking dark for Rafa Nadal from a health standpoint. And he had this operation, this foot ablation, and seemingly it worked. The fact that the foot has not been a concern now for a long time should be far, far more indicative of how you feel about Rafa Nadal going into 2023 than anything else. The fact that his foot is not in the conversation right now, that's enormous. That is enormous. But how quickly we forget, and now we're worried about Nadal's form, uh, in on the indoor hardcourt season, on these low bouncing hardcourts when he's barely played any tennis and he's playing top players, top eight guys, Tommy Paul, top 30 guy. And we're sounding the alarms when he's losing these matches. No. The, the sensible perspective to me is he just had a great year and he's healthy going into next year. That's what's important. Yes, 2023 for Nadal. The only thing that's not looking up is the number, the age. That's the only evidence that exists that suggests that there could be problems in 2023. Every other sign points to, a, to another good season. I mean, his win percentage was outstanding this year. The fact that he had a bad November does not erase that fact. And that he had health issues, obviously, you know, with the, the ab that will go away. I, I just don't understand the pessimism uh, with Nadal coming from these results. I don't get it. I, I think it's off the mark. Uh, from Nadakian, can Shapovalov have the same career arc as team? Am I wrong in thinking they are similar high power red line play styles with Chapo maybe even having a bit more raw physical tools? 
They both struggle to be consistent because their shots can get unwieldy, unwieldy uh, to frequently make consistent deep tournament runs. However, team took the next step and became consistent. What did he do that Chapo hasn't yet? This is so interesting. I love this question. So first you think about f what they have. Ability, talent, God gifts. And yeah, there are a lot of similarities there. They do have a lot of you know, similar talent. I actually think Shapovalov uh, naturally is a better ball striker, has better talent, uh, uh, sorry, timing, has a, a more live arm on the serve. But I, I also think he's a little bit less of a fitness freak. You know, team was one of the best... Um, I'll, I'll speak in past tense. I don't know where his fitness is at right now, but, you know, I, I'll speak in present tense, actually. Uh, he's one of the... One, one of the fittest players on tour. And I don't know, you know, that came from, you know, power, quickness. Endurance was, endurance was shaky, but I think that was about the energy exertion was like on another level with team. Uh, so I don't know that Shapovalov has the same God-given uh, genetics in terms of athleticism, but I think Shapo has better God-given genetics when it comes to uh, ball striking. Mentality is is where I have been concerned about Chapo in comparison to team. Team was this, you know, this... When he was coming up, the improvements were constantly obvious. He had a great coach, especially, I mean, you know, we saw... We saw him skyrocket when he hooked up with Masu. And Shapovalov has tried a lot of different coaches. You know, maybe Peter Polanski is the guy. Uh, I'm so encouraged by what I saw this fall from Shapo. So encouraged. Which is why I'm I'm so hopeful that you might be onto something here. But let's say before this fall, the concern with Shapo is, is he the kind of guy who is going to vigorously work at improving is he is he is he an elite trainer is he elite in in training or is he not so good at that you know some players are really great at making certain adjustments with their game making certain improvements in their game uh, some players don't have that ability as well and for uh, you know and for Chapo my concern was that he was very stuck in his ways. And another concern I had was that he was content, was that he was fine. And if you're content, that's okay. But sometimes some of the things that Chapovalov said had me wondering if he really was concerned with becoming a top five player in the future. I still don't know if, if he's concerned with that or not. To become a great champion, I think you need to improve like your life depends on it. And I think if you are in Chapo's position and you make the, the semifinals of Wimbledon and you lose in the semifinals, the reaction that I think most champions should have is you're pissed and you want more and you want to do better next time and you, you, you feel gutted. Like you're, you can't believe it. Chapo, I, you know, some, sometimes I just felt like he almost patted himself on the back for making the semis and that he was really proud of that and, uh, didn't, wasn't frustrated with the direction of his career. Maybe it helps to be a little bit frustrated until you get to the very, very top. So, those are my thoughts, but uh, I'm really optimistic because I've never seen Chapo look so different on the tennis court uh, than what I saw from him in, you know, the last the last month or so of the season, where his his technique changed. He stopped leaving his feet on his ground strokes. He stayed grounded. That improved his balance. He kept his head still. 
and he controlled his follow through. He made all these technical changes and to go along with those technical changes, or I'll, I won't say changes, I'll say improvements. He made these technical improvements to go along with those improvements was patience and good decisions. And I was just like, oh my God. So this is, you know, this is something that is not a mailbag question, but probably will be at some point. Who are you most looking forward to seeing in 2023? Chapo is right up there at the top of the list. From Alex Fry, has Titi Pass's backhand consistency and defense improved this year? Maybe slightly. Not as much as you'd hope. Philippousis has improved the slice, I think. You know, the slice is now something that I can say in good faith, uh, Titi Pass should at times attempt to use. There used to be a point where I, I legitimately felt like Titi Pass shouldn't slice because it was it was so bad. It was so bad that it was not smart for him to do it. Like he it, it just wasn't a good play. Uh now his slice is is good enough that it it's a weapon, it's a tool that he should use. The big difference is he stopped popping it up. His slice stays low now. Do I think it looks good? Not really. Uh, do I think it's oftentimes too slow? The slice, I think it's too. It comes off his racket too slow. Yes, it, you know it just floats. It's slow. I think that's an issue. Do I think it misses too much? I do. I do think it misses too much still. So there are issues, but at least it's not. It's not as. It's not as bad as it was. So that's good defensively. But on the backhand, I think the backhand, the drive backhand especially, it's pretty much the same. And there are still issues with trading, leaving the ball in the middle. Sometimes just it's not a good shield, meaning it misses too much. He makes mistakes. Not enough. Hasn't improved enough in my opinion. And that's why, like you look at CT Pasta's season, he hasn't done better this year. Uh, curious because I haven't, I'm curious to look at this. Um, let's see his win percentages over the course of the last uh, couple seasons. So this year, he's at 70%, 70.6. That's down, that's down 4% from where it was last year. Last year, he was at 74.7. Yeah, that's what I thought. It went down. He did have surgery in the offseason, remember. He had elbow surgery in the offseason, so maybe he would have made certain improvements had he um, had he not had to rehab his elbow. I don't know. But then, you know, the biggest issue was not technically for Titi Pass this season. The biggest reason the biggest issue was not technical. The biggest issue was a a new issue, a, an issue that I don't think existed before this year which is, uh, you know, mental inconsistency, getting distracted on court, losing his desire, his will on court, losing his temper on court, allowing opponents to get in his head, making silly decisions. And at times, not putting enough effort in. Those were the big problems for Titi Pass this season. Were there technical weaknesses? Yes. Same as last year, though. Probably a little bit better than last year. Yet he was worse. Why was he worse? To me, it's all mental this year. It was not as good a year. It was not as consistent a year mentally as I would hope. From Rachel. Hi, Gil. I've been so impressed with Fritz and Tiafo this season. Which American player do you think will have the best 2023? And do you think one of them could win a slam? This is a great question because part of me says, look, Tiafo has a lot of the same stuff that Taylor has. Big first serve, big forehand, excellent kind of precise and rock solid backhand, which is especially good on the return of serve. Second serve return. Um, but Francis has what, what Taylor doesn't, which is uh, variety, really, 
Uh, he's got great hands. He comes to net and he finishes points uh, in the in the forecourt. He does that really, really well. So that part of me thinks, oh, you know, Francis has a little bit more than than Taylor. But at the end of the day, I, I do think this the answer to this question, who is going to have a better 2023, I still think it's the obvious one. It's it's still, I think, Taylor Fritz. Who will finish as the top American in 2023? I think Tommy Paul belongs in the conversation. Uh, ben Shelton is a sleeper in this conversation. He is really, really good. He has torn it up on the on the Challenger Tour in the last month. Uh, he literally has only been playing professionally for like three months, and he's knocking on the door of the top 100. Is he there? He's he's literally he's either just inside or just outside the top 100 right now. So he's super super good. Ultimately, I still think it's Fritz. There's a level of there's a level of consistency that Fritz is bringing in his uh, power baseline game that is so foolproof. The movement has gotten better, obviously. He but you know he knows how he needs to play. He's he's been in the big moments. His uh, compete level is very consistent. I still think it's Taylor Fritz, best American in 2023. I can't bring myself to say it's going to be anyone anybody else. I don't think he can win a slam though. I I do think the physical limitations are are there. Last one, actually, sorry that that was the last one. That was the last one. I uh, hope you enjoyed that, everybody. Uh, if you are a member. Um, you can become a member by hitting the join button and contribute uh, two dollars a month to ensure the uh, the and and help out the long term future of the channel. Uh, the money goes back into the channel for the most part, or in large part, I should say. Uh, if you would like to become a member, you will get a priority. By the way, in the in the mailbag, in me answering the questions, that is the main perk. Just wanted to say that and plug that. I haven't talked about that in a long time. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, until then, uh, coverage of the ATP finals will continue, uh, which is brought to you by BetUS. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next time.